So next, I, I want to talk about tools for OpenMP programming. So um, we've, we've heard in uh, several talks before, so Christian has mentioned a, a few tools, and Root has uh, mentioned a lot of interesting results he has done with, with performance tools. Um, and yeah, I, I want to show you a little bit more what, what we have on our cluster. So um, actually, we have a lot of tools installed you can use for OpenMP. Um, I will mostly look on these two tools here, so the Intel Inspector XE and the Intel Amplifier XE. Um, of course, Intel is our default compiler, and these are more or less the default tools we use. We have several others installed, which give you the same functionality, um, or basically the same functionality. You can also use those. This is just an introduction. Um, and yeah, the, the basic takeaway message is, in which cases can tools help you in OpenMP? And if you have the problems I will describe here, then have a look at the tools which are available for you and just just uh, use them. You can use those, you can use others, it doesn't matter, but if you have the problems I will describe, then use a tool, of course they can really do a good job for you. And I have some, some overview and I will try to give a live demo of the tool course. I think it's more interesting to see how the tool actually works than just having a lot of slides with a lot of screenshots. For the website I have created a lot of slides with a lot of screenshots so that you can later on have a look at it and uh, see how to use the tools. So first tool is the Intel Inspector. This is a, a correctness checking tool. So you have done some first exercises with OpenMP, or maybe most of you have done, and um, maybe some of you already have seen what a, what a data race does with your program. So may I ask who, who had a data race in his first program he wrote here in the, in the exercises? Okay, there was no one doing any errors here. So then, please just, just continue with your exercises. I will nevertheless tell you what the tools can do if at some point in time you have an error in your code. But um, yeah, the, m the most important thing is um, in OpenMP you can have these so-called data races, which is a, a typical error in, in shared memory programming. And in OpenMP they um, yeah, every now and then occur, even if you are a good programmer, you might forget to put a private on some variable you use, or you might forget a reduction clause where it is actually needed. And um, the bad thing, as, as Christian also has said, if you have a data race which, which uh, is in your program, you do not always see the same behavior. So you might have um, two threads accessing the same variable. As Christian has shown, if you optimize on a higher level, these variables might stay in a register, so the error does not occur. You switch to, uh, to another compiler, the error occurs. It might depend on, on the number of threads you use. And it might completely go away if you attach a debugger like TotalView. Of course, TotalView attaches to all your threads and may give them some order, which always is the same and which will prevent you from seeing the data race. So formally, a data race is if you, if you have two or more threads who access the same memory location and one of the threads writes to the memory location and you do not have any critical region or lock to synchronize this access. As also Root has mentioned, if you only read data, it's not a problem. You can read a lot of shared data that's, that's uh, perfectly fine. You don't need to synchronize anything because everyone will just read the same results. Maybe have copies in their own cache, but that's not a problem as long as no one writes to the data. And yeah, if you write to the data, well, you sometimes see different results. They might only be slightly different, or they might be only different in, in some cases with some thread numbers, and they are really hard to find. And so it's, it's quite good that there are tools around which can detect these errors. So the Intel Inspector uh, can also detect other errors, like memory errors, if you, if you do not free your arrays, or if you just run over the bound of an array, um, there are checks to detect these errors as well. They are also in total view. I think you've seen some of the checks uh, in, in the exercises. It can detect deadlocks, which is a nice feature, but in my opinion, a deadlock is much easier to find than a data race, because you just wait until your program hangs, attach a debugger like total view, and look where the, where the threads are hanging. Uh, that in, in many cases is sufficient. So data races, in my opinion, are the most important errors you can detect here in this way. I will concentrate on those during, during the rest of the presentation. In principle, 
the Intel Inspector supports Linux and Windows. We will only cover Linux here. And um, uh, yeah, the, the former tool was the Thread Checker. There have been some, some improvements. One of the improvements I also want to show you is a static security analysis. So uh, yeah, it worked since compiler number 12. Now I think 14 is installed in our cluster, but still everything works fine. This can, um, at compile time, do some more checks, which at runtime do not, um, do not work. So again, the Pi example. So you've seen this several times now. Um, what you need to do basically to parallelize this loop, you've done this in the examples, you need a private version of, of the i, a private version of this fx, and a reduction on this f sum. So everyone can write this now without any problems. If, if you're uh, just waking up in the night at 3 o'clock, this will work fine. But let's assume we just started and we forgot the re reduction clause here. Yeah. So it might happen to some people that they, that they uh, write an error like this in their program. Maybe it's a larger program. And I want to show you how you can detect this. So, and I will try to do this in a in a live demo. So, hopefully, I'm all already logged into the cluster. Okay, I am. And um, let's see. Here's here's a Pi code. Um, so, where's the pragma here? So, the reduction clause is missing. We will have a database here. If you compile the code and run it. Okay, as Christian has shown yesterday, we don't see the data race. Of course, it's now in a, in a register. If we switch down the optimization, let's see, do we have a target debug here? Now we have optimization level zero. So no longer ex uh, extensive optimization. And now we see the, the result is completely different. So the error is uh, 0.6. And before there were a lot of zeros. I don't want to count them here right now. But yeah, you see now the data race really is uh, somehow influencing the result in a bad way. And if we run it again, we should see slightly different results. Uh, no, it worked fine. That's strange. <laughs> ah, yeah, now it, we again have an error. As I said, it depends on the ordering of the threads. So maybe the, the Linux operating system decided to first start one thread and execute the other one before the, when the first one has finished. Then, of course, we get the right result. So. You might really spend some time, if you have this in a real application, to find out what, what goes on. But you can use a tool here. So what you need to do in our class is you need to load a module first, which is called Intel IXE for Intel Expector XE. And there's a command line interface. I will show this later to you. There's also a GUI. I will take the GUI here. and. Um, I'm sorry, it's not possible in the GUI to uh, increase the font size. At least I did not find an option where I could do it. I hope you can read it a little bit. Otherwise, there are slides available in the web where the screenshots are what, what I'm, I'm doing here. So we need to create a new project in this case. We could give it any name. Let's call it Phi. Uh, Pi. So not Phi. What was that? Phi Day today. Um, and we want to go into this directory where the code is. And we create a project. Then we need to tell which application we want to analyze. Um, we take this pi x um, input parameters. We have an input file we want to parse in. And here we can change some environment variables. The default on our cluster is that OMPNUM threads is set to one. Um, if you run a program just with one thread, um, you will never see a data race, of course. So it does a runtime detection. If you just have one thread, you cannot create a data race because no two threads can execute the same memory location. So you need to take care that you at least use two threads. So we set OMP num threads to two here. Um, okay, the rest is fine. We click OK. We have a project now. We can do an analysis. So here are different things you can you can choose. As I said, there's there are also ways to do memory error analysis, but we want to look at the threading errors. 
and here are different levels. What this says to you is basically um, the first level only d detects a deadlock. So this is uh, the lowest information you can get. Second one detects a deadlock and a data race. The third one also locates where it is in the code. So you get a call stack, you get information which, which uh, line it was. But um, what the tool needs to do basically, it needs to look at all your memory accesses and basically store the information what your program has done with the memory to see if there is a data race or not. So this adds a lot of overhead. And this is what is given here with this X. So in the first mode, you should calculate 10 to 40X overhead. In the second, 20 to 80. And in the um, most expressive mode, it could even be that your program is 160 times slower than in the normal case. So if you do this on our cluster, please don't do this with your production data set, which runs for a week. Of course, if it is 100 times slower, you will get your results in, in nearly two years or so. Um, important, if you choose a data set and, and the code is, you, sh you need to execute all the passes in your code. So if your data set does something completely different than your production data set, there is no value in it, running it with the inspector. But um, if you, for example, run one iteration and you do not have a data race, then it's, uh, you know, if you just run more iterations with the same code, you will also not see the data. So you can reduce your data set as much as possible as long as, as still all the code is executed, you execute in production mode. And then you should really try to use a tiny data set so that, that your loops do not get too long and so on, um, so that you can uh, get the results in a reasonable amount of time. Um, if this still is, let's say, more than 20 minutes for your code or 30 minutes or so, you might not want to do this in interactive mode. Of course, if you really create a lot of load on our front-end machines, uh, someone might see this and kill your processes. Of course, you disturb the other users, and um, yeah, the front-end machines are just for interactive testing and so on. Of course, this GUI is hard to use in batch mode. That's why here's a, a button, or not that's why, but there are other reasons for this button, but you can use this button very easily to click on it and say command line. It gives you a command, this is insp -xe -cl for command line, so it's not the GUI, it's a command line interface. And for your project, these are the parameters you need to use in your batch script. So what you can do is you just copy and paste this into a batch file, submit it to uh, LSF, you will get a batch node where this is executed. It will uh, create the same output um, as it creates interactively now. Um, and you can just, if you have the output directory, open it in the inspector on the front end node again if the batch job has finished. So this can uh, really help to reduce the load on the, on the front end nodes if your data set still runs for, for quite a while. If it runs very slow, you c uh, very short, you can just do it interactively, click the start button as I do here. Then it, yeah, it takes, takes a few seconds to analyze the code. Okay, we have an error here, that's not good. So it says my input file does not exist. Let's check if I have a type bolt here. No, it's called input. Did I choose the wrong directory maybe? I normally it should take this directory, but I will explicitly specify that I want to use this. Or maybe I just used the other one here, project directory. So let's see if it works now. Still does not find the input. Yeah, it still has a Py directory in there. That's didn't I click save? <laughs> Sadly. 
just specify the full path here. Okay, here's the, the program output, so I hope this is a good sign. And uh, the error is uh, quite high, so we should have had the data arrays in the execution, actually. Then we just need to wait a little bit. Of course, this uh, takes some while to post-process uh, the collected data and analyze if something went wrong and to create the report. So now it says it, it has detected an error here. And um, as you see, it says there is a data race in pi.c. So this is the summary. And it also gives you code location of the data race. Um, if you look at, at this uh, code snippets here, there are always at least two. Sometimes there are more than two. And it always says which one was a right or if uh, if it exists, uh, also if there is a read. And this uh, happens several times. So you have here occurrence one out of four. You can switch on here, but it's basically um, the same variable, which is always here. Here, for example, you see that, that there is a read on a variable and a write. And um, if you try to find out which variable caused uh, the data race, as I said, one of the accesses needs to be a write. So it's most of the time easier to find the write than the read. Of course, in, in one line of source code, typically you write to one variable and can read multiple variables. So just look at what's, what's the write um, lines and to which variable could be written in this line. And th this is, of course, this f sum. And um, as we have forgotten the f sum uh, reduction in the code, or we removed it, um, for the purpose of this example, um, we see that's correct. The tool has, has found the error. If you want to see a little bit more of the source code, you can just double click here and, y and you get a larger view where you can scroll up and down um, if you want to see what's, what's going on in the code and want to visualize it direct directly here. If you know what to fix, you can click again and it opens your default editor under Linux and you can just correct the code, recompile it, run the experiments again. So just to demonstrate a different type of error, let's assume here we've done something completely stupid. In this case, of course, it's just three lines above this uh, add statement. But what if we would have done the variable f sum private? So do we still have a data race then? Does anybody know? Or do you see? Yeah, so that's correct. Uh, no, there is no, no more data race because everyone gets a, a private version. Um, we can just recompile the code. Again, in debug mode so that, that we've done the same than before. And we can just check if the tool now does not detect this, the data race. Just hopefully just takes a few seconds. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's clear to everyone that, that the answer you will get still is not what you basically desire to have. So now um, you basically get a zero. Of course, the variable is made private. And as Christian has explained in OpenMP, uh, if you have a private variable, you, li you leave the Powell region the results are just thrown away and you get the previous variable back. 
So this is not what you wanted. The tool does not detect anything here, no problems, but the result still is completely nonsense. And as I mentioned, uh, um, I also wanted to show you this uh, static security analysis tool. So, of course, at runtime, the tool just sees, well, you do not have any access to the data um, with multiple threads. That's fine, there's no data race. And of course, at runtime, uh, it cannot analyze, well, there was a parallel region, you wrote a result and, and have thrown away basically what, what you did. Um, so this is static security analysis. To use it, basically, you have to add a flag, this one here, when you use the Intel compiler on the command line. So it says Diag enable SC full. Now there are other levels than SC full. You can only check for, for um, less problems. But if you compile with this, it will, at compile time, analyze the code you wrote and create a report for you, as it says here. Static analysis completed, results are available in this R000SC. And you can open this again in the GUI. You can also do this on the command line, but I like the GUI better. So it's not the fastest tool which uh, I've ever seen, but it can really provide you a lot of uh, useful information. So it's worth waiting a few seconds. And um, now it does not say everything is okay. It says you have a, a misuse of private here. And um, yeah, if you if you re read the reports here, um, it says basically the variable you read or in this case, the variable you read was uninitialized because a private variable is uninitialized at, at the entrance. Um, and you read it and did something with the result in your code that may, may not be what you intended. And um, yeah, you have a last assignment and you read it after the Powell region, but the, the result from the pi private variable is gone. That's the first. And it says consider using last private to get the value out of the Powell region. We know that's not correct, we need to use a reduction here. But at least it points us to, well, you have written a result here, you use it later on, but through your um, data sharing attributes of the Pell region, the result is already gone. So this is also really useful information which you can generate automatically for your code and see, well, did I do something wrong with the data sharing attributes? Which, in my opinion, the data sharing attributes, getting them right for real application is, is one of the most challenging parts in Powell OpenMP programming, and tool support is a really good thing here. So you should should really have a look at this if you have your own code. Okay, so that was all for, for the inspector. So as I said, here are slides in the slide deck where it's, it's explained how to use it and so on. And um, there is also this command line tool. If you click on this create command line button, you automatically get a command line. Otherwise, you can also use it directly if you really like. Some Linux programmers don't like GUIs. So this XECL uh, gives you the same uh, options than, than the GUI. You just need to look up in the, in the um, documentation how you can basically specify everything. So and you can detect for the same errors and so on, of course. Okay, the next tool is the Amplifier XE from Intel. That's a tool for a different purpose. So let's assume uh, you have a code and it maybe is, is serial or you have an OpenMP Parallel version of your code um, and you are not really happy with the performance of your code. So it's hard to see, well, what to, what to do to basically improve the performance. And first of all, it is... Uh, very useful thing to look at the time where did you spend execution time in your code. So most of the time um, people think they have a good understanding of what the application is doing, but sometimes um, you might be surprised in which routines you spend time. Of course, it might not always be um, 
the most uh, challenging parts from a programming point where you spend most of the time. Sometimes you just spend a lot of time in, in I.O., which you just programmed a few months ago in, I don't know, one hour or so. And you think, okay, that's done. That's how, how, how it needs to be done. But you have maybe done something not, not in the optimal way. And, and you're not aware of where you do spend your time. And tools can really give you a good overview. As, as Root has shown, there are tools uh, around which you can use for this, like, like uh, from Oracle. And basically, I think most of the tools give you the same basic information. So where, where did you spend time if you have a Powell application? Um, which threads did which amount of work? How long have they waited at a barrier and so on? And um, most of the tools also co support, as, as Ruth mentioned, these hardware performance counters. The Intel VTune does as well. So hardware performance counters, I will, I will show you a list later on what, what you can do there, um, are hard to understand. But there are small registers on the CPU which basically count special events like cache misses or data transferred um, over, over an interconnect and so on. So you can really get detailed information on what's going on on your hardware, but it's it's not easy to understand. So this is really, if you want to get a deep understanding of what's what's going on, but it's not for the beginning. So at the beginning, you should just look at the time where did your application spend time, and it gives you a good overview where you should maybe think about tuning or parallelizing your your application. So for this purpose, I've chosen an, another program, a very small benchmark program, which is called Stream. And it's just used to measure um, the bandwidth of a system. So what it does, basically, um, it does some, some vector operations. So it copies one vector into the other. It adds or multiplies a scalar to one vector, writes it to, to another, adds two vectors, writes it into another one. And so the last one is this triad operation, which um, takes a scalar, multiplies it to a vector, adds it to another one, stores it in a third vector. And the output you get basically is the, the memory bandwidth you've achieved. If your arrays are large enough so that they do not fit into the cache, this is a good estimate of what your machine can deliver on memory bandwidth. That's where the benchmark is used for. And there are these four um, small kernel operations um, which are basically computed here. So if you would not know that, that these are the, the most important parts. Let's assume we have a tool here like, like the amplifier. Again, you need to load a module on our systems. Um, it's called Intel VTune. Of course, the tool was called VTune before it was renamed to Amplifier XE. So Intel, every now and then, adds features to the tools and thinks um, they need to have a new name for it so that people are really aware of this, something different. And now it's called uh, Amplifier, but we did not rename our modules. This is still called VTune. So that's just just because it was easier for us to keep them, the names the same. OK, I already loaded the module, so I cannot load it again, hopefully. And then I can start a GUI again here. Ah, sorry, I'm in the wrong directory. I wanted to go to the stream example. By the way, I should be able to increase the font size of the shell. <laughs> Not of the tools, but there it should work. So I can just uh, compile the code. And let's just see if I if I run the code. So in, in this case, I've started with four threads. And it says, well, you get a bandwidth of, of this. That's uh, nearly 20 gigabytes per second. I'm just running on, on one of the sockets. That's that's what I get on the system. And now I want to analyze this code. So one important thing, um, if you compile your application and you want to see source code later on, that's the same for the inspector. But normally, if you debug, you always have this minus G option on. But um, for, for the performance tools, you should also add the minus G flag, which adds a little information, so that basically the program counter can be mapped back to your source code. Otherwise, you would just see assembler code in the tool, which is hard to read for many people, uh, including myself. And if you want to see the C source code or Fortran source code, you need to add this minus G flag when you compile. If you also add the optimization flag minus O2 or some uh, other optimizations, um, 
it will still optimize, but add the debug symbols. So it will not slow down your code extremely if you just add the debug symbols. And then le now let's start the GUI. Again, we need to create a project that's the same as with the inspector, so I will do it wrong for three times, I guess. I oh know, but we don't have many parameters, that's easier. See how it was, was correct already. Okay. Again, we can specify the num threads variable. Let's say we again we want to start with four threads, and again we have this run button where we can click on. And now we see we can do different types of analysis here. So the basic hotspot analysis is just um, yeah, looking at the time spent in which lines of source code in which functions. So you get some timing information on where did my, my application spend time. That's basically what I would recommend to do first for, for nearly all applications. Um, the advanced hotspots analysis basically tries to give the same an information but in different ways. So this uses some internally some hardware counters which might give you some slightly more precise results, but I, I don't think it's, it's very important to use this. But I should mention, if you use hardware counters or if you want to use them, um, this does not work on most of our cluster machines. Of course, for some security reasons, um, we only have one machine where you need special access to. This is Cluster Linux Tuning, where I'm locked in here now. And um, we have some special kernel modules loaded there, which allow you to use the hardware counters with VTune. But um, there might be the theoretical chance that these uh, kernel modules uh, can allow users to get privileged uh, access to the system and might, um, yeah, not not uh, get get root access, but get more rights than they should get. Because of that, this machine is uh, secured by special software called Kerberos, and you need to be activated for it. If you would get root access to the system, you would not see any other directories than your home directory or your work directory, and no other users directories, which could happen on other systems. And um, since we want to be sure that no one can do anything bad with, with other users' data. We have this special mechanism here. So if you want to use hardware counters, you need to write an email to the service desk. Seen, you've seen the email address uh, several times on other slides, I think. And you, you we can activate your account for it, and um, then you can use this. Another thing you can look at is this concurrency analysis. If you have a multi-threaded program, um, it can tell you in, in which parts of the program you have which amount of parallelism used, and um, this can, can give you some um, useful information on w did you do a good job in parallelizing or not. And this locks and waits is, f for example, in OpenMP programs can tell you where did, did my threads wait, for example, in a barrier, and so on. So when did I have overhead through synchronization, or when did I wait in a lock, and so on. So this gives, gives you more, for multi-threaded application information on where do I waste basically performance th through um, waiting and synchronization constructs. But for the beginning, let's do the basic hotspots analysis. Oh, I forgot to mention. Here are other hardware counter um, analysis. This is predefined things. If you use hardware counters, um, here's a set of hardware counters which are automatically generated if you do this general exploration and so on. Um, yeah, they are really hard to understand. So as, as Ruth said, if you need deep insight, maybe you should contact one, one of us and um, we can really look at which counters you may need. If you know what you're doing and you have insights and, for example, this instruction run, br inst retired all branches has a good meaning to you, you know what it means, then um, you can just use it here on, on cluster links tuning and get the information. You can also do some custom analysis where you where you basically say, um, for example, here I said I want to have 
Um, this and this hardware counter recorded, and um, I should know what they mean, and I, I want to analyze only these counters, no timing information, and this works as well. And if you work on the um, Intel Xeon Phi coprocessors, for example, we see OpenMP target construct, or with, with a native execution, it also uh, works. You can use this Knight's Corner platform analysis. So this, again, gives you this hotspot analysis, but in this case, you get the hotspots of the code be being executed on the coprocessor. So you need to tell the tool I want to um, have the information on the coprocessor. It will then start some uh, other uh, processes on the coprocessor to basically observe your application, generate the information at the end, copy them back, and also show them in the GUI. So this is not always done automatically. You need to specify this at the start here, but you can do this. But it, it takes a little bit longer because the data needs to be copied and so on. And, and of course, it only works on, on uh, the machines where the coprocessors are inside, so cluster phi and so on. But let's do some, some basic hotspot analysis on, on the host system here for demonstration purposes. So again, it runs for, for quite a while and then needs uh, some time to post-process the data and to, to visualize what we've done. Let's see if we got some output on the shell. Yeah, so the output, I don't know why. In the inspector, there's a window where you see the output on the bottom left side. In the amplifier, you get the output on, on the shell, but you can see here, this is what we measured. We again get 19 gigabytes per second, as we've seen before, so there's not a lot of overhead um, introduced by this tool. So what we observe should basically be what, what has been done in the execution. So we get this summary report here which basically says, okay, we used four threads. Um, we had some overhead time, but it's, it's, not, oh, sorry. it's not that high. The total CPU time was 7.6 seconds. And um, here it says, okay, these are the, the parts of your program where you spend it most of the time, which is all PAL regions. So all the four kernels I've shown you, these vector operations are all parallelized within uh, PAL 4 Pragma and OpenMP, and these are these four regions. Um, it also gives you this basic uh, CPU usage histogram, which, which basically says most of the time we've been using four CPUs, which is good. We started four threads, so it's basically what we expected. So you always have a, a small amount of time where you, where you only use three or sometimes two threads. That's been when the startup process is, is uh, working and it, it just detected three threads in this time frame. You can also have more details. So there are two ways to show your function. This is bottom up and this top down approach. I am pref so it shows the same information, the same functions. I, I just prefer the top down approach, which, which basically means we start at, at the main function and you can go down in your function hierarchy the bottom-up approach shows the lowest functions and you can go up until main. So here we see some, some timeline view in the bottom part of, of the tool. Um, and we see we have three worker threads and this is the main thread, starter thread. Um, and here basically you can see different information. This CPU time shows you when when have these threads been uh, working on the CPU. Of course, if you, for example, have only a dual core system, you start four threads. There are not uh, enough CPUs for threads, or if you are on a front-end machine with multiple other users, the operating system might just decide to schedule some other process on the core, and uh, you, you do not get a core all the time. Then you would see some holes here in the CPU time. And of course, um, this is something you cannot optimize away in your application. So if the operating system doesn't give you a core, your application cannot do any progress. So you should, should be aware of this. If, if, it's, if you didn't get CPU time, you cannot compute anything that's not a problem of your application. It might be a problem that there were not enough resources in the operating system. Then it says when threads were running. So we can just deactivate it when threads were running and when we had overhead. So this overhead could uh, could be we wait in a, in a barrier or so, or we um, are in a, in a log or something like that. 
And here we see this is a total time. We can open this and see, okay, this is uh, glibc starting our main function. Then we have main and we have OMP forks is basically everything which is inside of OMP regions is below this branch. And here we have the parallel regions. So here we have the four larger ones. These are the, the compute kernels. We can uh, we see the line information here. And there's another small one. This is when we initialize the data at, at the beginning. And there's one to, um, for correctness checking, I think, at the end. But if you want to know, well, where, where did this take place in my code? Maybe you don't know what happened in line 241 of your um, code. In every source line, of course, it's hard to remember. You can just double click on it. And you get, um, after waiting a few seconds, the source code of your application, if everything works fine now. Okay. <laughs> Ah, no, yeah, now we can see anything. Um, so you see, for example, this kernel, this was this vector addition kernel here, where we have A and B, we add this and store this in C. And you can see um, basically how many time was spent here in, in, in which line. So you should be aware if you, if you look at um, information like this, um, how it is roughly generated. So it is... Um, a so-called sampling-based approach to generate the data, which basically means um, after a certain time interval, the application is stopped and it's, it looks, where's the program counter? And um, then it says, okay, for, for the last time interval, I will add the time to the statement where the counter is at the moment. So in average, you will get a pretty good uh, estimation of where, where your code, uh, or where your time was spent but it's not a 100% uh, exact result here. So you might get some, um, yeah, let's say noise in your data. And also, if it maps back to the source code, so a compiler can do a lot of tricky things with your code. So for example, move some, some load instructions before uh, other instructions to get have the data available, insert something in between and so on. So sometimes it's not always easy to map to the absolutely correct source code lines. So you also might see some time spent here in, in the lines before or after the line which actually produced all the work. So you should roughly look at a region of the code and look at the time spent there. Um, you should not bet on uh, this that, that this uh, line took 19 times the time than this one, so it's not that accurate. You should be aware of this. But if you look at a at a loop, for example, or at some larger region, it's it's quite good if your code runs for a reasonable time. So it should run for, say, a few seconds or so if you just have an, an application um, which, which finishes after a few microseconds. The results might not be that accurate, but typically you don't have to optimize these applications a lot because they are finished quite fast. Okay, so... Yeah, here you can you can get information. If you would um, have done the analysis with, with hardware counters, you would just not see only time here. You would also see um, the, the numbers the hardware counters have basically produced. Another thing to mention here, which um, I personally don't like, the tool always, if I do this example, says I've done a poor job here. And um, if you look at the, at the summary view, that comes from, from this distribution here. So I said I want to run with four threads, and the tool detects, well, there are much more threads available, so 24 in this case. So ideal would be if I would be 24 times parallel. And, well, it would be okay if I'm in this range, but everything uh, below, at least 12 threads, so using all cores, the poor says is, uh, it's poor. Of course, if I know there may be other people on, on the machine and I only want to use four cores, cores um, I can ignore this or I can just uh, shift these around so I can say, well, I know, I, can, I need to wait a little bit. 
I, I know I cannot get more than, than four, so then, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get the re result. And then I can see, well, for example, if I don't have four all the time, but sometimes have two, I might be pointed to, to the lines in the source code where it only was two times parallel or so. Okay, so much for the demo. So as I said, um, there are, again, slides where everything is explained. And yeah, as I said, I wanted to give you a list of the hardware counters we have available, just um, to inform you what, what's available on a modern CPU, so even if it's a, uh, an older one. Um, so there are more around today. So you can basically measure everything. Sometimes there are hardware counters which you might understand, like this one. So if you have a level two requests, um, this basically means uh, yeah, all the requests you have for code and data in the level two cache. But there are also hardware counters like this one, which you, where you can read the name. You might, if you are an expert, have a guess what it means. Um, if you read the explanation tools give you or the documentation give you, which is this, um, for some people it might be clear what it does, but there are a lot of hardware counters which real users don't understand and don't need. And the, the purpose the hardware counters are added and why they have these strange names, which basically no one would choose if he's asked to design a name for a hardware counter is, um, they are more for, for debugging when, when the uh, chips are designed. So hardware vendors need to check, well, does my floating point unit work in the right way and so on, so they can just, um, with these hardware counters, check what's going on on the chip. And then when the chip is designed, these counters are still there, so why not give an interface to the user to also report all these numbers? But they are not all really useful for applications. So if you, uh, if you look at, at some matrices, you can compute from the hardware counters. There are a few things which might be useful or more useful than looking at, at all the details. Here are two examples. For example, if you look at, at clock cycles per instruction, so you can, of course, measure the clock cycles, which if you don't uh, clock your CPU up and down, basically the time your application took. And you can count the number of instructions you've executed with a hardware counter. Then you can just calculate how many instructions did I do per clock cycle. If you have a, a high number, this basically means while your program was executing, um, you, you really have waited a long time for one instruction. Might be an indication that, for example, you load a lot of stuff from memory where you have to wait and you cannot compute anything other in this time. So it, it's um, not a guarantee that your progr program is, is producing bad performance, but it's a hint. If you have a, a high value for clock cycles per instruction, you maybe want to look at these routines. Of course, most of the cycles, the CPU is doing nothing. And um, on, a, on a modern CPU, you can execute um, up to four instructions per clock cycle, so a good value uh, maybe on modern CPUs you can do more, but on the, on the ones we have here as class and Linux tuning, you can have four instructions. So if you measure it there and you get a value between uh, 0 0.25 and 1, we would say that's, that's quite a good value. If you are above this, depends on how much you are above, but then you might want to look at this part of your program. Another thing is these floating point uh, operations per second or flops, which you've heard over the week maybe several times. So you can um, basically describe um, the, the peak performance of a system. In megaflops, you can see what, what's the maximum number of operations a system can perform. You can use hardware counters to measure this for your application. And at the end, you will find out, well, I'm just uh, doing, I don't know, 5% of the floating point operations a system could perform, which Actually, it's not a bad value, so many applications uh, cannot really get better than 5% of what's possible. But at least it's good to know. And if you know, I expect my application to perform really like, like the Linpack benchmark, which is used to measure for the top 500 list. You should get 80% and you see 3%. You might want to look at these kernels where you see the low number of floating point operations. So looking at these matrices might make more sense. and. Um, yeah, they, they can at least give you some understandable information, whereas most of the hardware counters are really 
for experts or for hardware designers to understand. So in summary, um, correctness tools, I, I would really recommend everyone who writes an OpenMP code or shared, shared memory parallelized code, um, before you do it in production mode, use an inspector tool. It takes some time, so the configuration is done quite easy, as you've seen. It takes some time to run, but um, if it at the end says you don't have any problems, you can just run the production mode with much, uh, yeah, which is with a much better feeling. And in many cases, um, we've seen codes here where even for codes used in production mode, the inspector could find some cases where some data races could occur and where the code could be fixed. So it's, it's really a useful tool. I would recommend to use it. If you do performance tuning, many people just uh, start adding uh, measurement of time in their code, measuring some start and end time and printing out. You do this for, for your main loops and then you look in some functions, you add some more output and at the end um, if you run your program, you produce a lot of timing numbers which you all print out to, to the shell. So um, this can give you information of what your program is doing, but there exist tools which can give you the information in an easier way and without um, adding a lot of stuff, maybe with if defs before and after, if def timings on or so. Um, so there are really tools around which can do this job for you, like the Internet Inspector. There are other tools which do the job in the same way or in, in other ways, but um, give you the same information. So you don't have to use these tools. Use whatever is available, but use a tool if you want to have this kind of information. It's, it's much easier, and um, a lot of experience from people who design these tools are in the tools, which can help you analyze the data much faster and much better than just with writing printfs in your code. <coughs> 